to say uh, good news T3 aircraft is gone away. But uh, the bad news is uh, two soldiers have left behind. And so they were there watching their, their ride home disappear off into the, uh, into the sky without them. I have tears in my eyes um, about the whole situation. Dark all around, all lights on the airfield were switched off and it was just pitch black darkness. Satcom rang and I answered, and it was the op center in Wunsdorf. And they said, um, they said that there are two German soldiers still on the ground in Kabul, and we needed to go in and pick them up. And the first thought was, yeah, goodness. Well, yeah, where, where, do we, where do we begin with that? Um, yes, of course, we'll do it, not a problem. Um, and then you just start going through the going through the planning and well, okay, what are we going to do? First thing we need to do is find out that definitely not on board one of the other aircraft. So we got their names. Um, I called through to the other aircraft and said, look, these are the two guys that are missing or that are that are on the ground. Do you have them on board? Do a quick roll call, please. So they went through, checked. A couple of minutes later, it came back. Nope, they're not on board. Okay, fine. Then we're going to go back and go in and get them, we'll see you in Tashkent. Yes, we knew we were going to land in an active war zone. We've seen the pictures uh, of American aircrafts being surrounded by civilians. And also, when we approached Kabul for the first time, uh, we heard a pilot transmitting over the radio uh, that he saw gunfire. And it's a very strange feeling to be uh, on the next plane landing and uh, yeah, the pilot in front just reported gunfire, then you start to know, uh, uh, or you start to realize that uh, it might be going uh, very wrong. Uh, yeah, and you, there's a threat to be shot down. The other issue that we had was that it was dark at this point, and we didn't have any night vision devices with us. It was meant to be a, a daylight mission, and at the time, um, neither the uh, neither myself or my co-pilot were uh, night vision qualified. So we were now faced with going into an unlit airfield with an aircraft that didn't have the equipment to to allow us to do that in the safest possible way. So we discussed these um, issues with us as a crew, and came to the conclusion that well, yes, absolutely, we can, we can go and do it. It's not ideal, the situation that we're in, but it's, it's manageable. Even the, the normal inchment approach in Kabul is unusual due to, due to the terrain. So Kabul lies at about 6,000 feet above sea level, and it's surrounded by a, a big bowl of mountains, essentially up to about 14,000 feet. So it's a very mountainous area, difficult to, to operate in, um, and knowing that, knowing how the, the airfield was laid out, knowing roughly where we would be going when we landed, that was, um, that was of enormous help. Um, we wanted to do an ILS approach, but uh, there was a big problem, and that was that the airfield was completely black. So there was no lightning at all, and it was the, one of the darkest nights I ever saw. It wasn't a, a controlled airfield, in the, like most airfields are. So that meant that we, we didn't actually get a landing clearance, but we were told to land at our own risk. Um, there are lots of small airfields that are also uncontrolled in Germany, in the UK, all over the place, and you never get a landing clearance. You get told to land at your discretion. But this time was the first time I've ever been told that I can land at my own risk. And that kind of stuck in the, uh, stuck in the mind a little bit. 400. North East, North 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 Either side of the, of the center line, there were um, 
half a dozen different aircraft from, from different nations, so um, A400s, C-17s, C-130s, from all sorts of different nations, all of them being loaded, so streams of people all over the place, streams of passengers, soldiers all over the place. Um, and the, the ground controller said, right, your parking spot is the one right at the very end. And by the way, there's no marshaller and nobody, no follow me, just make your own way. And there was just this sea of humanity ahead of us, everybody milling around and we didn't have contact with with the guys that we were that we were there to there to meet so stopped and um, the um, loadmaster then put the put the ramp down in this area it's completely darkness darkness and and and, and, and smoke from the from the attack and so we, we see we see nothing and wait you can't see uh, 10 meters there was no aircraft, there was no, no person in, in this area. And we wait uh, five, between 50 minutes, I don't know. I forget the, the time. And then uh, the co-pilot say, uh, oh, there comes two person, I see uh, shadows. Mostly dark there, I mean, a few sort of spotlights and what have, or floodlights, so we could see some stuff, but sort of not really pick out detail and we saw these two guys running towards the, the aircraft and they were both dragging um, enormous cases with them, um, wearing helmets with weapons. Um, so clearly they were, they were soldiers rather than, rather than civilians, which was a good start. But they were running straight towards the aircraft and straight towards the aircraft engines. So we've got two huge spinning propellers on each wing and they were running directly towards and my heart just sunk, I thought, my goodness, we've made it all this way. And then the danger for them running into, into the propellers was just that, yeah, that was, um, that was a, a heart stopping moment. But luckily they're sensible and kind of ran round to, uh, to the side and round to the back of the aircraft. Um, and spoke to, um, spoke to Groby, the loadie, who checked, the, um, checked their IDs, made sure that they were who we thought they were, um, brought them on board. Um, and then we closed up the closed up the ramp, organised our taxi back to the uh, back to the runway, and then um, got ourselves ready for the ready for the departure. I sit down. I Anschnell. I take I I uh, fix the seat belt, and I um, come down. You uh, train and exercise to uh, make, um, to manage the logistic, but uh, you don't train uh, that you left behind in an international airport. It's not like uh, you forgot uh, or you get forgot at a shooting range that you take your um, backpack and walk at a military base. And you're in a foreign land and uh, you have nothing on you. Uh, a cell phone and uh, yeah you have um, to react so it must have been I don't know it felt like only a couple of minutes that we were that we were on the ground um, stationary it, it was probably in reality maybe five or ten minutes um, but as soon as they were on um, on board we were able to, to taxi pretty much straight away um, almost as the as the ramp was moving um, and taxied round to the uh, to the runway, ready for departure. Um, you asked earlier about my previous experience of Kabul. Um, for the approach, that was helpful, but for the departure, that was really invaluable, because Kabul sits in this little bowl, and I knew that for the for the departure, um, if I got airborne and went straight ahead for a thousand feet, and then turned right towards the north. Then there's a nice little saddle in the, in the mountains there and we could fly over and then there's some lower ground and we'd all be nice and safe. Because we couldn't see any of the terrain around us. Um, so we just, um, we then launched, got airborne and just into the, into the darkness and uh, turned right at the right time and disappeared. When we stopped at the parking position in Tashkent, we still did all the operating procedures, so we did the parking flow, the parking checklist, shut down the aircraft, 
and uh, the minute the engines were, yeah, were stopped, we saw like every car on the on the ground was just pointing slightly towards us. So everyone was just coming to the aircraft, and yeah, a couple of minutes the aircraft was like overrun by <laughs> by our guys. So. Um, like CES2, so our security guys and stuff, which also did the briefing for the flight. Um, and uh, she just arrived at the aircraft and she was so, so happy to see us. She, she just started crying right at the moment. <laughs> and uh, that was the first time I, yeah, I realized what happened at all. Um, also, um you think about it not on the flight to uh, Uzbekistan. You think about this situation, um, or I think about this situation when I get specially at home. Uh, when you um, take your wife in arms, um, see the kids, and then you remind, um, whoa, I was the last man, or the, the last German man on Kabul International Airport. So, um, and then uh, the feelings came. Uh, you cry, you get tears in your eyes, um, you take your wife to you, um, hold it in your arms. Uh, yeah. You can kind of go through I'd been through my whole career and I'd done, I've done a lot of super interesting things and I've moved stuff all around the world. But this time it was actually really important what we were doing. And I think until it happens, you never know how you're going to react. You hear You hear stories of things that, that other people have done and you wonder, well, if I were in that situation, how would I react? And I've now, I've now seen that, I've answered that question and, and I'm really proud of, of what we did and, and how it worked out and how we worked together as, as a team and how everything has kind of come together to, to that point. The, the excellent training that I've had with, with the Brits, the excellent training that I've had with the Germans, and the fact that I can then be, as a Royal Air Force officer, the captain of a, of a German aircraft that can go and do something like that and actually really, really make a difference and really do something. It was, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm really proud. You the the captain of the of the last aircraft out of Kabul? I said, yeah. I said, yep. Yeah. Um, my name's Chef, and, and I'm one of the guys that you rescued. I said nothing. Um, we only uh, hold each other in the arms, and uh, feeling the moment. 